3D printing and CNC milling both have their strengths and weaknesses. But can we get a great result from combining them? Today, an experiment. This is an experiment that I've wanted to try for years now and I'm glad that I finally got around to it. We use the additive manufacturing of 3D printing to produce an oversized part and then use the subtractive manufacturing of CNC milling to trim it to the final spec. Does it pay off? Yes and no. Let's look at the test project. You might have seen some videos previously on the channel back when I was still teaching about my students' participation in the F1 in Schools competition. At the heart of this was the design, manufacturing and assembling of these insanely fast race cars that achieved 0 to 80 km per hour in under a second. A highlight was having my team win the Australian development class and qualify for the world finals held in Abu Dhabi. But that meant upping our game by switching to the professional class, requiring finite element analysis, CFD and actual wind tunnel testing. One of the biggest changes however was the need to design and manufacture your own multi-part wheels. Various teams tried various methods over the years, including 3D printing. These were convenient, but had visible layer lines, and they weren't perfectly accurate. Another team experimented with milling the wheels out of 15mm thick acrylic, but towards the end of the job, the acrylic got quite hot and lost dimensional accuracy from warping. This required some attention on the lathe, but we still weren't able to get them exactly where we needed them. We were able to finish and race the cars, and we scored well in most elements of the competition, but wheel inaccuracy tended to remain a challenge. The 3D printed wheels were quite fast, used very little material, but we could see layer lines and they weren't quite accurate enough. Whereas the CNC milled wheels were highly accurate, but made poor use of the very expensive 15mm acrylic, and their accuracy suffered in parts unless we carefully managed heat and warping. The idea is that starting with a 3D printed object will still be fast and efficient with materials and if we produce this part over size and then mill it down to spec, we should have a high level of accuracy as long as we manage heat and warping. Excellent on paper, but of course a new challenge is added from the added complexity of the two-stage process. That's the situation, it is very specific, but ultimately it's quite suitable. So what exactly is the plan? Of course, this isn't a new idea. For example, when E3D introduced their tool changer, they talked about ASMBL, Additive Subtractive Manufacturing by Layer, where a compact spindle was used to machine parts of the print midway through. This would allow the convenience of 3D printing, but also provide surfaces with exact tolerances for fitting external parts. However, we never had such a machine, so here was our plan using a regular 3D printer and CNC mill. We would start with a 3D printed wheel blank oversized to the final object. It could be bolted to a threaded mounting plate that acted like a spoil board and it would have a section up the top to locate the end mill and zero the machine. The excess printed plastic could then be machined away to leave what was hopefully a smooth and accurate surface, ideal for such a competitive competition. First of all, we need to find a suitable filament for 3D printing that will survive the heat and therefore warping of CNC milling. To do this, I created a very simple test piece slicing it with high infill, but most importantly, increased perimeters all around to give it meaty exterior walls. I printed this from several filaments, firstly PLA, which is a control, and I expect to be a melty disaster. Next, PETG, as a common, easy to find filament that has better thermal resistance. Apollo X, which is based on ASA, which is based on ABS, so high thermal resistance. And finally, nylon, which warped off the bed and came loose which is why I'm hoping the other filaments provide a better solution. Previously when working with Apollo X, I found that I could belt sand the surface without it overheating and melting into a mess. I was also able to drill through it, again without anything melting, unlike PLA which does this occasionally. With Apollo X, my sanding worked through the outside perimeters, but apart from that, the plastic didn't melt and held its shape, so that's what I'll be testing for with my samples. To the disc sander and linisher then. It's a crude test, but my aim is to push it against the sanding pad, trying to remove material but also to heat it up. Finally, I'll apply a lot of pressure to see if the material melts, and if so, inspect how much of a mess it becomes. And here are the samples. As you might expect, PLA became a molten mess and really lost its shape. PTG was surprisingly good. When it did melt, the result was minimal. Apollo X looked quite a bit like PLA in the end, which surprised me given my previous testing with this. 
and finally nylon, look just like PLA and Apollo X. For the actual 3D print plus CNC test, I've chosen to continue with PETG as well as Apollo X. So PETG is emerging as the dark horse, so it's time to produce the final design and to prep the CNC mill. So here is my wheel and it's quite simplified compared to an F1 in school's design, but it's suitable for this test. This blue section here is a bearing. These are used in the wheels to minimize rolling resistance and they have a three millimeter bore. I have a seven millimeter wide pocket where I wanna test how snugly the bearing fits. And underneath that is a space for a bolt to hold the wheel down when it's being machined. The whole point of this process is to have oversized geometry so we can mill back to our chosen shape and that's what you're seeing here in blue. The center bore should be just big enough for our bolt to slide down through and then we have this little lip to center the CNC end mill and help us zero the machine. A section view of the model hopefully illustrates more clearly the way everything will be held. The next step of course is to print our oversized wheels in PETG as well as Apollo X. I wanted the wheel to be completely solid but rather than change the infill percentage I upped the amount of perimeters. This results in a solid model with a very nice concentric infill. The PETG model on the right has some fine stringing and both models share a visible Z seam, the type of wall artifact that gave us issues in the past. The printed lip on top was just about ideal for locating the 6mm end mill, however the gap it left wasn't quite big enough for the bolt to go through, with my solution being to grind down a bolt until it could pass through. I picked a piece of scrap plywood to act as a spoil board and drilled out a hole slightly smaller than this threaded insert before butchering my application of super glue and after I had removed the excess, I used a long bolt with a washer to pull the threaded insert into the bottom of the ply. The bolt marked the top of the spoil board but that didn't matter as the underside was flush and ready to go. I secured the first printed piece to the spoil board which was now ready to head to the CNC router where it was clamped down in the center of the work area. I moved the cutting bit into the rough position before then switching to 0.1mm increments to lower it down just above the printed piece. To help with my final alignment I would turn the spindle by hand which allowed me to better align the end mill with the correct homing spot. Once I was confident, I zeroed the machine. Finally, the moment of truth, and things started poorly, but I was able to refine. I used the CAM software Desk Proto for this experiment, and this was my final toolpath. In fact, this was iteration number six, so let's look at how we got here. Visualizing the G-code, we started off with a meandering toolpath, which means it was a mix of conventional as well as climb cutting. Spindle RPM was 15,000 and feed rate was 500 millimeters per minute, which I thought was a little slow. So I used the machine controls to manually double the feed rate to 1,000 millimeters per minute. The toolpath at this stage was pretty inefficient, cutting an outer section and then lifting up so it could return to the interior of the model to cut the toolpath there. My thinking was that this would give the plastic some time to cool so it wouldn't melt. My favorite part of the job is when the temporary boss is milled away in the center. But what I didn't enjoy was seeing the screw come loose and then the model remove itself on the final pass of the whole job. And of course that ruined the exterior of the wheel. So on to iteration two. Firstly, I used some Loctite on the retaining bolt as well as applying more torque to secure it to the spoil board. The G code was updated to have the thousand millimeters per minute feed rate permanently added. And another change I made in order to speed up the job was changing the step down from one millimeter to two millimeters. And this proved to be a little too aggressive, the added force actually snapping the base of the 3D print, leading to a second spectacular failure. Therefore, iteration three restored the one millimeter drop down to avoid this calamity. And this proved to be a successful combination with my first wheel actually completing without any failures. Well, almost, because an error I made in setting up the job in Desproto left a very small lip on the bottom of the model that wasn't cut. You can't see it, but you can feel it, and it's kind of like elephant's foot. For number four, I lowered the depth of the final cut. This made a mess of the spoil board, but that's its job. And its sacrifice ensured the wheel had the same diameter the whole way along the span. Iteration 5 looks the same, but is more efficient. It splits the inner and outer portions of the job into two separate parts, so the cutter could continuously work in the one area, rather than going back and forth as it had been earlier. You might have also noticed that I switched to only climb milling, which on paper should give a better surface finish. There was one change for the final iteration. 
in an attempt to combat the vertical lines being left in the surface of the outer wheel, which I believed were from these repetitive vertical movements, I introduced a ramping strategy rather than a vertical movement for each layer change, seen here with the zigzagging downward movement. And with this, I had a very reliable way of machining the wheels. Eventually I did get there, but were the results worth the extra effort? First up, we're testing for dimensional accuracy, and there are three crucial elements. The first is a test fit of the 7mm bearing in the internal bore, and I'm pleased to report that on the print and then machine version, it's a very snug and perfect fit. So how does that compare to a version which is entirely 3D printed, done on a printer with a small nozzle? Unfortunately, the bore for the bearing isn't quite right, which means the model or the slicing process would need to be adjusted to give the correct clearance. Next up, external diameter. The rules stipulate a minimum of 26 millimeters, so we normally aim for around 26.2 or 26.3. The completely printed version is pretty accurate for this, but there is variation, meaning it's not entirely round. It also has a slight bit of elephant's foot, so in that section, the diameter is actually closer to 27 millimeters. The printed then machined wheels were actually quite consistent, measuring 26.2 consistently around their diameter, and best of all, the diameter was quite repeatable across the set of four wheels. The CNC I used has ball screws instead of belts, so this probably helps with consistency. Our final dimension is the wheel width. Again, the minimum is 15, so we aim for just above this. The 3D printed wheel was pretty close, but my first three machine wheels were consistent at 15.6, but of course that is actually too wide for what we were aiming for. When zeroing the machine, I found it really hard to tell when the cutter had been lowered enough to be touching the right portion of the model. For the final wheel, I zeroed the Z-axis on the surface of the timber, moved the end mill into position to zero X and Y, and then manually moved the Z-height to 15.3 before zeroing again. And this change in process gave me a much closer final value of 15.2mm. Our final comparison is surface quality, which does affect performance. On the inside, the left hand wheel has the cool machining marks, but the important part is the wheel surface. On the machined wheel, there are definitely pits and marks that detract from the appearance, but it is actually smoother and more uniform than the printed version. I did experiment by drilling out the spoil board mounting hole, which means when we insert a long bolt, it's centered by the bearing, which should be concentric with the outer surface of the wheel. That means rotation should be true, and therefore we have the capacity to wet sand and polish the exterior of the wheel to a nicer surface finish. However, I'm not very patient with sanding. Three of these have been sanded, one of them not, and as you can see, after my efforts, there really wasn't much difference. I felt that my machining chip size was in the ballpark, but further experimentation with feeds and speeds would probably net a better surface finish. If you're wondering about PETG versus Apollo X, I didn't really find any difference, so I stuck with PETG because it's more readily available. The only change that I would make for the printing is upping the temperature and the flow rate to prevent any gaps between the extrusions and to give maximum strength. I would guess for most people that this really isn't worth the effort, but for others with a specific application like this, it might be just what they need. Let me know your thoughts below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing plus CNC milling. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.